Okay, so um, thanks everyone for coming. So this is uh, sort of work in progress with Nathan Prittis, who is Matthew's advisor, and uh, Yaoshan Wen, who's in Korea. And it's been a really fun project because it's, it's on a topic that when we kind of started talking together, the three of us, I knew nothing about. And uh, we basically have just been having a one hour Zoom meeting once a week for like two years. And the first six months or so was Yashang just explaining some of the conjectures that are out there to us. And, uh, you know, the whole time I didn't really know if anything was going to come of it in terms of papers, but I was learning interesting stuff and having a good time. And so we just kept going. and. Uh, we, had, we did end up getting some results, which I'm kind of excited about. So, um, so that's what this is about. But it's a kind of new topic for me, and I thought it'd be good for this seminar because there's some cool combinatorics connected to this, this subject. So um, what I'm going to mostly talk about is quivers and mutations of quivers. And if we have time, we'll uh, talk about some results. So let me give the definition of a quiver. Really it's just a directed graph. So the, the edges have a direction to them, so we call them arrows. So I'll denote the vertices of the graph, the set of vertices by Q0, and the set of edges, or arrows, one. And there's going to be two types of vertices. So we're going to draw them as squares and circles, if you draw one of these. The vertices are split into so-called framed vertices and gauged vertices. And when you think of this, you should think of the framed ones as sort of being normal vertices, and the gauged ones are going to have a group associated to them. So if you ever see the word gauged, it's a physics word that means there's some group acting on stuff and that's involved somehow. So they've got the framed vertices and the gauged vertices. So as an example, here's a Nice simple example. It's got three vertices. Um, and three arrows between them. And the square means framed and the circle means gauge. So these ones are the gauge ones. This one is framed. Okay. So that's a quiver. And what we're going to do is we're going to decorate this graph with some extra information um, of some vector spaces. And we'll decorate each of these, each of these uh, gauge nodes with a group. So for any of the vertices, we assign a vector space complex vector space, finite dimensional. So really, you know, we're just sort of choosing a, a rank for each vertex. And if I is gauged, uh, we look at the general linear group on VI, kind of include that in our data. is a gauged vertex. Consider the action of... Um, so that in general, you could look at other groups, but I'm just going to always have my group be the group 
of linear automorphisms of Vi. So this acts on Vi. Okay. This isn't really extra data, is it? Well, yeah, I mean, but it, but it could, so more generally you could choose a different, you could choose a, different you could do, you could choose a subgroup of the general linear group. And then that would be a good Yes, 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 yes. Um, and these arrows are like morphisms, right? Yeah, we're going to, we're going to think of the arrows as representing another vector space, which is the set of homomorphisms from a VI to a VJ. Exactly. So if I have an arrow going from I to J in Q1, I'm going to consider a set of linear maps from VI to VJ. And so you can just think of this as matrices of size NJ by NI, acting by left multiplication. Um, okay, and then notice that uh, if, if one of these vertices is gauged, so we've got this group associated to it acting on VI, that's going to induce an action on this vector space. Um, more down to earth, uh, you know, these are invertible matrices, and they're going to multiply either on the left or the right against these matrices. So if I is gauged, We'll consider the action of GI on this vector space. So I think, you know, if I set things up correctly, this action should be um, multiplying the matrix M, the NJ by NI matrix M, on the right by G inverse. And if J is gauge, then we have left multiplication. So GJ X by left multiplication. Okay. And so once we've assigned these vector spaces um, and considered these uh, these vector spaces, we're gonna put all this together to get an action of one big group on one big vector space. So I'm going to look at the vector space V, which is just the direct sum over all the arrows of HOM VI VJ. And my group G is just going to be the direct sum, or I guess maybe the product, um, over the gauge vertices of these general linear groups. Okay. And because the GI acts on, GI or GJ acts on HOM VI VJ, we get an action of G on this direct sum here. So you're thinking of these homes as vector spaces of matrices, just... What? You're thinking of these homes as vector spaces of matrices. I am, yeah. And I'm just so trying, I, you know, I've, trying to piece together the direct sum of the homes, because like, when I see hum, my mind goes to group, and I'm like, wait, no, that's not right. It's like a, a vector space of, of the matrices under like matrix addition and scalar. Yeah, this, vector, yeah. this is direct sum of vector spaces. Yeah, got yep. Um, yeah. So G acts on V. And the point is you can, you can take a GIT quotient to V by G and you get some algebraic variety. So given a choice, GIT quotients depend on a choice of character, which I'm going to kind of systematically ignore in this talk. But, um, is a way to take quotients, which we've talked about in previous seminar, and this is kind of the setting, a setting where it works. So we can define what's called a GIT quotient 
of this group acting on V, and we get an algebraic variety which you should think of as the quotient of V by G. So this is called a quiver variety because it comes from a quiver. So this is kind of a general construction, and you get lots of interesting varieties this way. Um, maybe I will skip ahead to do an example. So there's a little more to the definition that I'm going to add in a second, but first let's see an example, just to, to see that this is not an unfamiliar So I'm going to label my vertices just by the rank of the vector space. So I put an N here, you should think I've got a CN. That's this vector space. i put a K here. I've got one gauge node. So this is my quiver. It's got one edge. And I've labeled the vertices with the rank of the associated vector space. Okay. So what's the GIT question in this case? Well, I'm looking at um, the vector space I'm looking at, there's one edge. So it's just um, from CK to CN. So that's the set of N by K matrices. So I'm looking at the set of matrices of size N by K, and I'm quotienting by the action of GLK. Okay. And when you take this GIT quotient, what you do is you, you throw out some sort of bad subset of this vector space, and then you take a, you know, roughly take a set theoretic quotient once you've thrown out the bad locus. Um, and in this case, the bad locus is, is the locus of matrices which are not full rank. And so when I take this GIT quotient, I want to throw those out. And so what I'm really looking at is a set of n by k matrices of full rank. modulo the equivalence under this GLK action, okay? And so, um, in my K matrices, I should think of the columns of these matrices, since it's full rank, as defining a K-dimensional subspace of CN, and the GLK action is just, um, you know, essentially changing the basis of that subspace, and so this is parameterizing the set of all k-dimensional subspaces of Cn, which is a variety that, that we all know and love. It's the Grassmannian of k-planes in Cn. So the quiver variety associated to this quiver is just the Grassmannian. Flag varieties this way, um, and a lot, lot more interesting things as well. Questions? Okay. So I skipped one thing in my definition. Uh, there's a little extra uh, that you can get out of a quiver, and it, it turns out if your quiver has a has a loop, so a cycle of directed arrows where you can go from one vertex to another to another and follow arrows to get back to where you started. Um, that corresponds to a function on your quiver variety. So given a cycle C,
claim there's an associated function, which initially is going to be a function on the, the vector space v. Okay, so how does this work? Well, each of these arrows corresponds to a vector space of homomorphisms. And so uh, I'm actually going to start with this arrow. So a subspace inside of V comes from the direct sum of, of these arrows. So it's hom vk to v0 is the last arrow here, plus hom vk minus 1 to vk. This is a subspace V. So if I define a function on this subspace and then just extend constantly, I get a function on V. And so I'll denote this function by FC, uh, indexed by the cycle C. And the way it works is, OK, so I've got a, a tuple of matrices as an element of, of this vector space. So I'll denote them by M0K. This is a matrix of size uh, rank of vk cross rank of v0. Maybe I should give myself more space. Okay, so this is an element inside of here. And where it gets sent under this function is I can compose all of these homomorphisms. I can go from v0 to vk, if I have an element of here, and then go from vk to vk minus 1, etc., and then go back to v0. So I take the, you know, the, the matrix multiplication, essentially. And this is some matrix. And I'm going to take the trace of that matrix get a function. Okay. And the trace is invariant under conjugation, and it's going to turn out to tell you that it doesn't depend on the cyclic ordering of this cycle. Okay. Um, so you get a function for every cycle, and you can take a linear combination of those functions, um, some you know random linear combination of those functions to get a function on V. I'm going to define W to be the sum over all cycles in Q of each of these functions times some constant. Okay. And, um, Yeah. Me a silly question. You might have said this already. I'm just looking back at these uh, definitions you're doing. Uh, when you did the example with the GL, uh, the Grassmannian example. This one? Yeah. yeah. What's this choice of theta? What does that theta do? And what is it in this case? Well, in this case, uh, there's only one good choice of theta. In general, you might have. Well, what is theta? I don't what, even know what, what the is. Well, so theta should be some character of this, so you could do like the determinant. determinant. Okay. And um, in general, what this GIT recipe does is it tells you what subset to look at here. Uh, oh, because you have this full rank thing. Yeah, and so that's telling you that we're actually not quotienting by this whole thing, but this uh, open subset of full rank matrices. So the theta tells you, but the theta is from GLK to C, and yet you're talking about like what it does on V somehow? Yeah, so um, you could think of theta as defining a G equivariant line bundle on here. Okay. Or, you know, sure. G equivariant homomorphism from this to C. Okay. 
And you take like the non-zero. Yeah, you look at the locus of points for which there's a section mm -hmm. or the value of that section at that point is non-zero. Okay. And that's the semi-stable locus. Okay. You cool. throw away everything else. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Okay. Um if I if I take an element of my gauge group, um, you know, maybe maybe uh, GK, it's gonna act by multiplication on, I guess, the right here and the left here. And so uh, the trace is going to be invariant under that group action, which is why we're doing the trace. And so uh, this is actually going to be a g-invariant function. And so it's going to descend to a function on the quotient. So we get a function on, on y. Which I'll, I'll still call w. And this is sometimes, I think this term's coming from physics, sometimes called the superpotential on y. Mark, really with you. That I just gave it. Yeah. But that quotient um, is a different type of quotient than the like quotients we've already seen, or is just a different notation? Uh, were you here for the GIT talk? Or what quotients have we already seen? That's my question. Oh, well, you know, like quotient of modules is not the same type of a quotient of modules. No, it's not. Okay. Um, you should think of this as like projective space is a quotient of CN by C star. Okay. But you have to remove the origin if you want to think of projective space as those equivalence classes. Okay. And this is a generalization of that where you remove something mm -hmm. and then you look at um, equivalence classes of elements in V under this G action. Mm -hmm. Okay. But projective space is, is the example to have in mind, or the Grassmannian is yeah. maybe for this talk a better example to have in mind. So the, the outcome of all of this is a quiver variety y together with a superpotential on y, a function on y. And in, in terms of geometry, what, what's the space we want to consider um, from this data? You should think of this data as, as defining a space given by what's called the critical locus of W, which is just the locus where DW is zero. And what this means, if you want to work like on a, on a chart, so just look at local coordinates, I'm just saying uh, the locus where all the partials of W are zero. Okay, and so that's going to be some, some algebraic subvariety of y. And that's really the thing we want to consider from this quiver. Okay, so this is you know, some general procedure of constructing some interesting algebraic varieties is, is how to think about it. And because quivers are very combinatorial, you might expect um, that information about this space should have a nice combinatorial structure. So now let me talk about mutations. So a mutation is something you can, you can do to a quiver to get a new quiver. And it's going to give us a new quiver variety as well. So given, given some quiver Q, and really when I say quiver now, I'm thinking of more than just the uh, directed graph, I'm thinking of it also with the vector spaces attached to each vertex. Then choose, choose a circle vertex. 
So choose one of the gauged vertices. Then what I will define is the mutation of the quiver Q at this vertex J. So what I get is going to depend on my choice of gauge vertex. And it's a new quiver. Constructed from Q. As follows. So first what we're going to do is um, For any sequence of arrows, which goes through J, so if I have some I going to J and then going out to K, I'm going to replace that, I'm going to sort of compose and just replace it with a single arrow from I to K. And I'm going to switch the direction of these arrows as well. So I replace it essentially with a cycle, where I have an arrow from I to K, and I reverse the direction of those two arrows. Okay, so I, I compose and reverse the direction of the arrows. That's the first step. I'm also going to um, change the rank at vertex J, change the rank of the vector space. So I replace the vector space at J with a new vector space C capital N, and I have to tell you what this N is. The general definition is a little complicated, but in examples it's easy. So it's going to be the maximum of one of two numbers, the sum of the dimensions of all incoming vector spaces. So I look at the dimension of all the vector spaces with an arrow going to j, and I sum that up. Or the sum of the dimensions of all the outgoing vector spaces. Minus the, not j, minus the dimension in j. Okay. So, I don't know, that seems kind of unmotivated, but I'll give you an example and hopefully it will convince you that, at least in one example, this is a reasonable thing to do. Um, okay, and then that's kind of the main, the main thing, but we have to do a little cleaning. So we don't like two cycles. We don't like little loops with two edges. So if any two cycle was introduced in process one, And I delete, I delete it. I delete both these edges. And then the, the final thing is we're going to adjust our function. So um, notice that we may have created some new cycles this way, and so we should add the associated uh, function to our super potential. So for each new cycle C, which was created, I'm going to add a generic multiple of FC to my super potential. Okay. Um, for those of you that 
might study combinatorics. The, this next thing I'm going to say is something I don't know anything about, but, um, but just to maybe get you interested. Mutations of quivers is closely related to a, a huge topic in combinatorics known as cluster algebras. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess these it's are like invented. half of the talks at every conference I go to. Oh, okay. So half the talks. Half of the OPAC a bunch. Yeah, it was like, well, maybe a quarter of the talks at OPAC. Wow. Yeah. So this was a sequence, I think it was introduced in, in a sequence of papers by Fomi, Solovinsky, and um, one of them had Arcadi as well. Um, the papers were in Jans, Invenciones, Duke, and Compositia, so um, they were pretty highly received. Um, so let me just say a few words. You can ask Maria for more information. But cluster algebra, algebra is, as far as I understand, this is this is an interesting class of, of commutative rings, which are uh, defined as subsets of the ring of uh, rational functions and some number of variables. Um, I know there's a lot of interesting unsolved conjectures about positivity of coefficients of elements of these rings, um, and it's closely related to a lot of uh, topics in geometry, such as quiver varieties. Um, I guess it's connected to things like Pluker coordinates, coordinate rings of certain combinatorially defined varieties and things like that. And there's some really interesting like open combinatorial conjectures about cluster algebras that are like the big questions that everybody's working towards. It's about like whether some set of monomials forms the basis of the cluster algebra or something in general. I see. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so what, what I'm going to talk about is also like connected to this cluster algebra story, but I don't know enough of that side to Me say anything <laughs> precise. I also don't know anything about it. Cool. All right, so um, the main thing I wanted to get to today was what's called the mutation conjecture. And this is a conjecture about these two quiver varieties you get, one from a quiver Q and the other from after mutating. So let Q be a, I'll call it just a decorated quiver, which means I've chosen vector spaces, and Q prime a mutation of Q. Then, as we saw, you get associated um, quiver varieties, Y and Y prime, together with these superpotentials W and W prime. Um, and, and the conjecture, which I'll just say very vaguely, that the geometry of these two setups should be equivalent. Um, when I say these two quiver varieties, what I really mean is, is the critical locus of W, which is a subvariety of Y, and the critical locus of W prime, or the 
partials of W prime vanish, which is a subvariety of Y prime. So really, these two varieties should have equivalent geometry. And by geometry, um, I think there's probably a lot you can say. But for me, what, what this means, for me, is the gromov witten theory. Which is roughly corresponding to counting how many algebraic curves satisfying various conditions live inside Z, how many live inside Z prime. There should be some correspondence, which is going to be a very non-trivial correspondence, uh, not an obvious one, um, between those the theories on those two spaces. Okay. Well, let's do an example of a mutation. You can think of this evidence of the mutation conjecture, because in these examples, you will you will believe me that it should be true. So, if I do um, the previous quiver that we looked at, which was this one. Uh, we saw that the associated quiver variety was just the Grassmannian. And this quiver has no cycles, so there's no function on it, so the critical locus of the, the zero function is just y itself. Okay. Now, if I mutate this quiver, there's only one gauge node, so there's only one place I can mutate, which is at this node here. Um, there's no incoming edges, so I just reverse the direction of this, this edge. And then I replace k with the sum of the dimensions of all outgoing vector spaces. That's just n minus k. So I replace it with n minus k. Okay. And now y prime is going to be the set of all matrices of size n minus k by n. This was the set of all matrices of size k by n. And now I'm quotienting by GL in minus K instead of GLK. Okay. But now you could think of the rows of this matrix as describing a uh, N minus K dimensional subspace of CN. And this GL N minus K is the change of basis um, of those rows. So this gives you the dual Grassmannian of N minus K planes. And so, uh, in this case, the mutation conjecture, saying these two geometries should be equivalent, is reducing to the isomorphism between the Grassmannian of k-planes and the Grassmannian of n minus k-planes. Questions? What did reversing the arrow do? To the quiver variety. So this one was, um, I mean, it changes the order. So to call this one would be n, n by k. And this one, if I still had a k here, it would be k by n. So it's rows to columns. Yeah. And so you should think of, uh, like, here I'm looking at the columns as giving me my k-dimensional subspace. And so it's a subspace of, of CN, where CN is uh, n-dimensional column vectors. This is a subspace of CN, where CN is n-dimensional row vectors. And so those are really dual vector spaces. So you know, the right way to think of this would be, um, this is k-dimensional subspaces of some n-dimensional vector space. This is going to be n-minus k-dimensional subspaces of its dual. Okay, um, there's another example with, with a super potential, but maybe I'll, I'll save that for another time because it's a little involved. And hopefully this is enough evidence for you and we'll skip ahead to some results on this conjecture.
I'm probably, I'm definitely missing some, some names here. So physicists have been studying this for a lot longer than mathematicians. And I know that, I forgot to write down the, the paper, but um, I know there's some work with uh, what are called maybe abelian quiver varieties, where instead of looking at like GLK as the groups here, you look at the maximal abelian subgroup, which would be C, you know, be diagonal matrices within there. Um, but of most of most relevance to us is uh, first work of Haidom. Prove the conjecture for this example and the example I skipped, which I can tell you about some other time if you're interested. Um, and and one important thing to note is that even though you know we know these spaces are isomorphic, so you might say, okay, well the conjecture is trivial in this case, but that's not true because. If you write down the precise conjecture about what happens to the gromov witten invariance of the two spaces, even in this case where the spaces are isomorphic, the relationship between their gromov witten theories is a non-trivial one, which is predicted. Um, and so he proved a very non-trivial uh, relationship between the gromov witten theory of this space and that of this space, which is not just coming from the fact that they're isomorphic. Um, what it involves is you look at generating function, a generating function of gromov witten invariance of this space, and a generating function of gromov witten invariance of this space, and those two functions end up being the same under a, a non-trivial change of variables. So it's quite surprising. And for those of you taking complex analysis, the, uh, the proof involves a difficult contour integral. So, Of course it does. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, so complex analysis popping up in surprising places. And then, uh, since then, Ying Chen Zhang has done a lot of work on this conjecture. conjecture. So she's proven it for type A quivers. And those are quivers where the graph is a line. you could have either a circle or a square on these outer ones. So these are called type A quivers, and they correspond, if you look at what quiver variety you get out of a quiver like this, you get a generalization of the Grassmanni, and you get some flag variety. Okay. But what's interesting here is if you, if you mutate at one of these vertices in the middle, notice that you're going to add a cycle. So um, it's a little more interesting than this one. And then she also proved the conjecture for what are called star-shaped quivers, which is slightly more general than this. It's like you've got this vertex in the center, and then you've got a bunch of rays coming out and rays coming in of various lengths. Okay. But somehow maybe starting with a cycle in your quiver makes things harder. And interestingly, the proof of both of these use Haidong's result as kind of this fundamental building block. Um, so it's, it's all built from, from that original result. OK, so in the last three minutes, let me say some work in progress. So what um, Nathan and Yashang and I have done is we replace, we kind of changed the setup um, of our quiver varieties, and we replace the vector spaces at, at square nodes with vector bundles. So we're kind of doing a relative version of this construction. And so you start with your, your base, which is going to be a smooth projective variety. 
just arbitrary. And so I'll just show you what happens in, in an example. Let E and F be vector bundles on X. Okay. And I'm going to make a technical assumption, which is, helps us make this whole thing work. And I'm going to assume these vector bundles are direct sums of line bundles. So E is a direct sum of line bundles L high, and F is a direct sum of line bundles PJ. Um, furthermore, another technical condition is, is we require that E tensor the dual of F be ample, or be a sum of ample line bundles. Um, but for this talk, you don't need to worry about that. And the, the quiver that's, that's most interesting to us right now, but I think the methods generalize quite a bit, is this quiver, where now I've replaced a vector space here by a vector bundle. And so um, I'm thinking of homomorphisms now from trivial rank k vector bundle to E. And here I'm thinking of homomorphisms from F to a trivial rank k vector bundle over X. And the mutation of this quiver at this node gives us this one. And so the quiver varieties we end up looking at are um, Rather than the Grassmannian, now I'm looking at the Grassmannian bundle of k planes inside of E. So this is a this is a fiber bundle over X, and over a particular point in here, I'm looking at all k planes within the fiber of E over X. And y turns out to be a vector bundle on this Grassmannian, which is the tautological bundle tensor F dual. And uh, y prime involves looking at the Grassmannian of n minus k planes over E dual, dual of this vector space. And it's the vector bundle, which is the tautological bundle tensor F plus E tensor F dual. So that, that's our quiver variety for this quiver. And, and this one also has a super potential attached to it. Okay. And our theorem So this is this is really like a, a, a this variety is a, is a fiber bundle over X and the fiber uh, over each point is going to be the quiver variety that you would normally get from this quiver. So we're getting a family of quiver varieties over X and a family of mutated quiver varieties over X. And the theorem is that the geometry, gromov witten theory of Y and the gromov witten theory after mutation of Y prime with this superpotential, um, that these are corresponding to each other as in the original conjecture. Okay. So there's there's a reason that we're focused on these types of relative quiver varieties. Um, it wasn't just sort of like because we could, but I'm out of time, so I think I'll stop there. Thanks. I don't know much about this stuff, but being a lecturer on once. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in the same boat as you now. <laughs> and it was a different uh, sort of uh, aspect of it. So to find a quiver, as it is, just a graph, directed graph. Yeah. 
Can you then define an instance of the quiver to be uh, the assignment of a vector space to each vertex and the and a homomorphism for each edge? A fixed homomorphism? Yes. So that's an instance. Yeah, okay. And then if you have two instances on a graph, you can take the direct sum. You just direct sum all the vector spaces and then the two yeah. homomorphisms, uh, you patch them together. That's what I'm talking about. So you have a direct a concept of a direct sum operation on all of the possible ways of decorating the graph. Okay? Yes. And then once you have that, you can ask, well, what are the indecomposable instances? These are called like quiver representations, right? So, yeah, yeah, representation. Right, because it's like representation theory, but for multiple yeah. groups and multiple vector spaces. Yeah. Yeah. And the and then so you could ask, what are the indecomposable ones? And that's uh, the answer is so so. You can ask Ms. Leonard, they're, they're a finite number of indecomposable. Mm -hmm. So that everyone can. And the answer is independent of the direction of the arrows. Mm -hmm. And the, gra the underlying graphs have to test to be a Dinkin diagram. Ah. Either an AN, a DN, or E6, 7, or 8. Wow. And, and if, if, if it's a bigger graph than that, there are infinitely many indecomposables. Ah. And so, for instance, no cycles are allowed. Right. And you can see that just by having a, the graph with a, with a single edge that goes to itself. That's basically uh, an endomorphism, and you have Jordan blocks. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you have an infinite number of indecomposables because you right. can take any eigenvalue, right? So, right. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the only thing I know about quivers. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And it was, it's not hard to prove that theorem either, that, they're, that those are the only. I see. And if you look at the, indecom in the uh, indecomposable ones, and you can record the, the, uh, the sort of a, a maximal one for each graph, and if you record just the dimensions of the vector spaces for that maximal instance of the thing, it's exactly the numbers that occur in the multiplicity of the corresponding singularity of the surface. <laughs> it's it's so amazing. really kind of uh, yeah. amazing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just starting to learn about these things. Yeah. yeah. So this quiver mutation that you did seemed like a lot of simultaneous mutations. And these, do you know off the top of your head whether this big mutation that you did with like step one, two, three, four, whether that's like a um, composition of the quiver mutations that are a little smaller that are used to define the cluster algebras. What are those? They're like, I don't know, I'm off the top of my head. Like, can you there's just like, reverse an arrow? Does that count? No, no, there's like, I don't remember what they are, but they're like definitely sort of more one at a time than what you did, right? Like one little local quiver mutation is, I don't remember. I also don't remember. Um, I don't but know. I just don't that'd know be, if you looked at how it relates to Fomin and Zelovinsky's work. It'd be great to talk to you talk. about. I don't, yeah. I'd have to look at them too. <laughs> I don't have these on the top right? yeah. But yeah, it's, that's cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, all three of us are coming from gromov witten theory, so yeah. part of the reason I gave this talk was to see if the combinatorialists had any insight or... Yeah, I mean, I, cluster algebras are, are starting to be used for so many different things now, and I, I think the one that I've seen is just like, you have some ring that you want to understand better, like maybe a cohomology ring or something, but actually usually more like a coordinate ring. Mm -hmm. um, and you want some like basis for it. Even mm -hmm. if it's like a quotient, you want like a basis that generates it as a vector space. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can use like, you can find like a cluster basis if you find like a cluster structure on, uh, to make it into a cluster algebra, right? If you find cluster variables and the right quiver or whatever, um, then you can, you can um, I don't know. <laughs> you have to like prove a whole bunch of like there's like a formula for doing it. You like prove a whole bunch of combinatorial properties, and then like the result comes out. And I, I don't know how it works exactly, but um, it doesn't sound like you got, you're dealing with any particular ring that you're trying to find a basis for or anything. Or no, anything. there there is one. So oh, for okay. us, um, I said the actual conjecture involves these generating functions of gromov witten invariants. Oh, okay. And those generating functions have some parameters involved. Okay. 
and those parameters are the change of variables, and that that is a cluster mutation oh, okay. of okay. those variables. Oh, the variables, right, right. Yeah. Um, okay. And that that's like, well, I don't understand cluster algebra as much, but I think that's a pretty mysterious thing because it, it has some like very broad implications about um, the physics behind all this. Cool. So this, this is just a tip of the iceberg, what I know so far. But I think it's a really interesting connection. Yeah, that's cool. All right, thanks.